right, all right, all right. What is going on? What's going on? Welcome, 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 welcome. Uh, my name is Emma Williams. I'm the founder and creator of Health by Any Means Necessary. How's everybody doing? Yo, while y'all coming in here, go ahead. Let me know where y'all coming from, where you're at. Um, you know, just say what's up. Also, let me know what you know about PCOS. You know, what is and what's how uh, PCOS is caused. All right. So I just want to get a a feel of uh, you know what the community is aware of as far as PCOS. So let me know. Let me know. <clears throat> All right. Good. 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 Delaware, Delaware. Good. Good. All right. All right. So like I said, um, you know, make sure you subscribe to the channel, uh, both plat platforms. Uh, it's very important that we control our narrative, uh, all aspects of it, uh, including health, economics, uh, you know, current events, all those things. It's very important that we come ourselves and deliver it to our people. Uh, so this is part of that mission. This is part of that program. Um, so also make sure you uh, be sure to like the video. Go ahead and start hitting the like button right now. Uh, also share this video. I'm sure you uh, probably know someone who could utilize this information that we're disseminating right now um, as pertains to PCOS, but really as pertains to health in general. You know, make sure to get this message out. Um, you know, subscribe, share the video, hit the like button. All right. Yep. So, um, OK, good, good, good. Everybody has the uh, the, the abbreviations, right? Yes. So um, tonight we're talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, I can already see some question marks. So maybe you're probably wondering, what is a man doing speaking on this topic because it deals with women? Well, um, <clears throat> I'll start this conversation off the way I'm going to end it. And that's by making a statement that uh, may sound very strange right now. And that is that PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is diabetes of the ovaries pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome is merely diabetes of the ovaries okay now that's my final statement first statement and i'll explain this whole uh, process how that works uh right now so um the purpose of this is to pretty much bring awareness to what pcos is uh how it affects uh, the women uh, across the world, but mainly in our community. Uh, we're going to talk about some stats. We're going to talk about what PCOS is. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, signs and symptoms of PCOS, how people are diagnosed with PCOS, uh, the medical treatment and recommendations for PCOS. And then you're going to get the HBAM version of what it what causes it and how to actually prevent it and reverse it. That's how we do all these uh, talks that we're going to have. OK, so um, make sure y'all come on in thumbs up thumbs up there you go there you go hi who are you king credentials please just for my own info subconsciously so i'm not really sure what that means but uh if you want to know my credentials um yeah i practice medicine over here in florida i'm licensed i'm a uh, physician assistant i'm also a nutritionist i'm also a personal trainer i'm also a fat loss coach but i would say make all of that last on your priority list not that it's not important but i don't feel that that should be the most important thing uh what you should know and what should be the most important thing is that i'm your brother i'm somebody who has a strong uh invested interest in our community i need for us to do better as it pertains to our overall health in the community so if i didn't have the degrees um i would say we should not make the same mistake that many of our people in the past have made by uh, worshiping the society's degrees paperwork and accolades uh, you know, Dr. Sabi didn't have any degrees. Um, you know, uh, many of our black uh, practitioners don't have any degrees, but they'll body uh, these things as pertains to diabetes, high blood pressure. And a lot of times when you get the degree, you actually lose your mind because you go in and you learn the way of the pharmacology, ph pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, yeah, I have the degrees. Um, but at the same time, you know, I say that we make sure that we don't worship these degrees or we don't get carried away with worshiping these degrees because uh, many of our black practitioners who we have sent out from our community to go get these degrees is crickets when it's time for them to come back. <laughs> it's crickets. Um, they're not picking up and actually uh, working towards improving uh, many of the big epidemics in our, in our community, such as the diabetes epidemics, uh, the dialysis clinic epidemics, uh, the, the amputation rates that are just rapidly increasing. 
Um, many of them are being trained not to have any concern whatsoever about that, not to speak on those things, but instead let's speak on the opioid epidemic, which when you look at the numbers as it pertains to who it affects, not that the opioid epidemic is not an epidemic and not that it's not important, but is that really your organic thought? Did you really make the decision that the opioid epidemic is something that you need to address to your community? When we have, um, I just told you the other day, 75,000 uh, brothers and sisters that are dying each year from heart disease, uh, 18,000 from stroke, uh, 12 or 14,000 from diabetes, and all these things are preventable. Now, if you ask me, that is the epidemic, especially when we look at the Dallas clinics. However, why are our practitioners not speaking on that? They're only speaking on things that they're sanctioned to speak on. So they have to be given permission a lot of times, unfortunately. And so, um, yeah, those are my credentials, if that matters. All right. So um, let's go ahead and get it. Let's go ahead and get it. I rambled on enough. <laughs> All right. So PCOS. <clears throat> let's talk about some stats real quick. Um, so across America, roughly uh, 5 million women are said to have uh, PCOS. That's about 10 percent of women between the ages of 15. Yes, as early as 15. Uh, all the way to 44. So essentially, you're talking about uh, any time right after puberty, up until you know, uh, you know, we start seeing a decrease as far as uh, natural fertility. So any time between the years of uh, rep the reproductive ages, um, it is possible for a female to have PCOS. And so when it comes to when they when women actually find out when they have PCOS, it's usually going to be around the ages of 20 and 30. And this is because they're finding out that they're having a problem making a baby. They're finding out that they're having a problem uh, getting pregnant. And it's not making sense to them because they're not owning birth control. Um, you know, they've never been told uh, before in their life that they were they were infertile. Uh, blood work is coming back normal. Uh, the man is, you know, supposedly ha healthy as well, too. And so things aren't just things just are not lining up for why they're not becoming uh, pregnant. And uh, that's usually the years between between those years. That's when they become diagnosed uh, with PCOS. So when we're talking about PCOS, once again, I want to make sure we always break these words down. So PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So let's break it down. Poly. Anytime you see the word poly, this means many. Uh, cystic. Anytime you see the word cystic, this means fluid filled, fluid filled. Uh, ovarian. This is the ovaries. Um, that it also uh, it also has uh, the etymology is based in uh, egg, okay, egg, um, and then syndrome. And when you see syndrome in medicine, really, that's kind of like almost a cop out, low key cop out, because it's kind of like, man, we got all this stuff in the pot, and um, we really don't know what to do with it. But we know that they kind of connect in some way. We're just not really clear. Uh, so this is many cyst in the ovaries that comes with a whole bunch of uh, symptoms and we're not really clear on how to line this all up. So essentially when we're talking about PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, the very essence of it is that we're looking at a disruption in the woman's endocrine system. And this is going to result in uh, there being an increase in androgen levels. Uh, androgen levels are what is what's called male hormones. Particularly we're, called, we're talking about testosterone. So essentially, PCOS deals with the disruption of the endocrine system where it ends up increasing the male hormone called testosterone. And that increase in that male hormone is where we see a lot of the, uh, the, the symptoms. That, that's, that's where we see a lot of the symptoms coming from. OK, so um, <clears throat> we already talked about what PCOS mean. Uh, you know, like I said, you need to make sure um, that you understand that this is a uh, this is becoming this is increasing the rates of pcos is actually increasing in fact i know i said uh, 10 percent uh, but they'll draw that range out to 20 percent because uh, many people are not being properly diagnosed uh, unfortunately you have practitioners who are not really familiar with uh, the diagnosis of pcos they're not really linking things up um, because they're throwing medicines medicine on top of these symptoms and so pcos could very well be way more than 20%. All right. Everybody follow me so far. How y'all doing over there? How y'all doing? Good, good, good. All right. All right. All right. All right. So somebody says the granddaughter was clinically diagnosed 
uh, 15 years old. Now she's 22. Yeah. And so that's what we're talking about. You know, like I said, um, this is PCOS can be seen as early as 15. Uh, PCOS can be seen as early as, uh, you know, uh, puberty. So once puberty happens, you know, PCOS is a possibility. All right. So let's keep on going. So, um, <clears throat> all right, where was I at? So we talked about polycystic ovarian syndrome, what it meant. We talked about how it, uh, would it, how it essentially affects the, uh, the woman. Um, yeah. So once again, the, the, the essence of where uh, PCOS is really affecting the uh, woman, the female is going to be in the, the ovary. Uh, the ovaries are, are, is the or body part that's supposed to make eggs on a monthly cycle. And so uh, the ovaries are going to release the eggs. They're supposed to release the eggs each month. And when it, that's part of a healthy cycle. However, with PCOS, the eggs may not. There's two things that can happen. With PCOS, instead of the egg uh, developing inside of the ovary properly and then releasing and going into the uterus uh, to potentially be fertilized, and if it's not for life, then that lining will be shed. And that's when the actual uh, menstruation takes place. That's the normal way. But with PCOS, that egg may not fully develop or it may not be released from the ovary into the uterus. And so when that takes place, that's when the female is going to have a missed or irregular menstrual cycles. So, and um, I've, I've, I've had female patients who've gone like a whole year without seeing a menstrual cycle um, and be, because of PCOS or, you know, having incredibly infrequent uh, menstru menstruation periods, um, like going two months without it, seeing it for a couple of days and going three months without it, uh, then it popping up. And so uh, it's all over the board as far as the possibility and the frequency. But what you need to know is that being infrequent or irregular with your menstruation can cause infertility or it can make it very it can make it very hard to uh, become pregnant um in fact pcos is said to be one of the number one uh causes for until in infertility in women when those eggs are not released from the ovary it's going to turn into a cyst once again cyst just means uh small fluid filled sac. However, I feel like that's a misnomer because uh, that's not just fluid filled sac. That's actually an egg that was not fully developed or released. So let's talk about the symptoms. So right, we just covered what it is. We just talked about what PCOS is, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, essentially, it's a disruption in the uh, the endocrine system of a, of a woman. Um, this is where the, uh, the woman will now secrete more testosterone uh, then natural, this testosterone is coming from the ovaries, and I'll get more into that in a little bit. Um, this uh, disruption is going to throw off the natural cycle of the menstrual cycle. Um, and with this natural cycle being thrown off, uh, there's going to be great difficulty when it comes to becoming pregnant. Also, uh, the ovaries will now develop cysts, uh, but <clears throat> there's also more symptoms that go along with it. So let's talk about some of the, 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 the most common symptoms because there are some other ones. Um, and this is why they kind of call it a syndrome because it seems like it comes from all type of different uh, different places as far as what's going on. So once again, we already talked about the first one, which is irregular menstrual cycles. Um, we talked about how women who have, uh, you know, who miss periods, um, who, who are having fewer than eight menstrual cycles, uh, menstruations a year, um, they may possibly have PCOS. Um, you know, periods that are coming frequently, like uh, every 21 days or more often, um, you know, with some some women with PCOS are going to uh, have no menstruation whatsoever. And we already spoke about that. Uh, that's called anovulation. That's no ovulation whatsoever. Uh, the next symptom that is common and that you might see a lot is called heritorism. Heritorism is essentially where we start seeing hair on the face, particularly in the chin. Um, particularly in the areas that are very common for men to have hair, and that's where you're going to see in the chin. And the reason why this happens is because of the uh, androgen, the testosterone. Now, I'll talk more about it in a little bit, but I'll get to it a little bit right here as well, too. So uh, the when when insulin is secreting on the ovaries, 
and you have a high level of insulin secreting uh, affecting the ovaries, the ovaries are going to become insulin resistant. Um, the over actually the ovaries are going to be affected in a way where it's going to secrete more androgens, particularly uh, testosterone. So you're the ovaries are already secreting multiple hormones, particularly estrogen, uh, progesterone, and then testosterone. Yes, that's right. Women, your ovaries secrete testosterone. In men, your testicles secrete estrogen. There's just supposed to be a balance. And I'll tell you why that balance gets thrown off. So back to the androgens, the testosterone. That testosterone is now going to be increased uh, coming from the ovaries naturally you sh we should have enough of what they call sex binding uh sex sex binding hormones uh these are where you have sex hormones uh, floating around in your body uh, but they're supposed to be bounded but when they're not bound they ex they essentially can affect all aspects of the body uh without without going in the actual process that it should so when we're talking about pcos and we're talking about increase in testosterone we're now looking at that testosterone being deposited in the follicles in the face. So when the follicles are now uh, deposited in the face, uh, you're going to see an increase in the, the hair growth in the chin area, particularly. Um, we're also going to see an increase in acne on the face, right? So acne on the face is not always a sign of PCOS, of course, but also understand that acne is a sign of something acne is not just benign acne is a sign of something um now if women start getting acne on the chest like in this area right here or we start seeing acne particularly on the upper back area that's not normal and that's also a sign as well too so that tells us that your body is adapting to something and so that that requires further investigation but more so on your part not more so uh you know labs and diagnostic but more so on your part as far as you know what are you doing lifestyle wise uh also we're going to see a thinning in the hair um once again uh testosterone it starts going in the same places that it would go in men um and so you're going to get you, women are going to see thinning uh, particularly in this area right here and so uh that's going to mimic male pattern baldness so in men men say word y'all know what's going on um you know we start getting that hairline the hairline start backing it up like it's 99 to 2000 uh, we start getting that batman look with the hairline where it's like this and um and so that's what happens with men and when you have increase in testosterone that's going uh pretty much anywhere that it wants to go particularly in the scalp that hair is going to start thinning as well okay um and then we're also another symptom of pcos is weight gain weight gain and women are going to have just a very hard time losing that weight uh next you're also going to see uh darkening of the skin um this is what they call uh nigricans uh anc ancanthosis uh ancanthosis nigricans um essentially uh you're going to see when i see it usually it's on the back of the neck um now this is not just a dark line in the back of the neck uh this is more so like a dark and velvety you know i, I guess i would say velvety um, yeah, velvety uh, patch of black skin, dark skin, not just dark, but velvety. So that's abnormal. Um, particularly, you're going to see that on the back of the neck. Uh, you can also see that under the arms, uh, under the breasts, uh, in the groin area, a lot of places where it's warm and moist and dark. You know, that's well, warm, warm and moist. Yeah, warm and moist. That's where you're particularly going to see it at. Um, and then also you can see... Uh, skin tags skin tags you know skin tags are pretty much like the excess flap of skin that you have it looks it almost kind of looks like a tick um and so <clears throat> that once again is another sign of something adapting uh adaption process going on your body and then you know even more to the extreme pcos because of the increase in the androgens the uh, testosterone uh, women can also experience a deepening of the voice and that's because of the testosterone all right so everybody follow me so far as far as the symptoms of PCOS. Everybody follow me? How y'all doing in the chat? What's going on? What's going on? Ah, all right, all right, all right. So um, let's get back to it. So we talked about PCOS. We talked about the stats. Uh, we talked about what PCOS is, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, we talked about the symptoms of PCOS. 
Now, how is PCOS diagnosed? Well, before I go into the diagnosis, this diagnosis really tells us that in order for the patient to be able to answer a lot of these questions and to help out the uh, practitioner, they have to be listening to their bodies. And that's a problem today uh, for most of us, both men and women. Um, we really don't listen to our body. We really don't pay attention to our body. Uh, many times when we have we become sick or we have something going on, if we listen to our body, our body will let us know what's going on. It'll give us hints uh, for certain things that we can look for, or certain things that we can do. You know, everything from a chill to a fever uh, to a cough to a sneeze. Like the this is the original body language. Your body is constantly trying to communicate with us. Uh, to let us know what type of moves we should make. The problem is, is that we've been conditioned by Western medicine to see these this communication as a disease. So blood pressure go up, it's a disease. Uh, blood sugar go up, it's a disease. Cholesterol goes up, it's a disease. You just cough, you got a disease. So we have to move away from that, that mindset, move away from that thinking, and we need to get to the area or the level where we we just ask ourselves is this appropriate or is it inappropriate is it inappropriate given the given the environment or is it appropriate given the environment because if we ask that question then we will understand that based on the environment that our bodies are dealing with both external but mainly internal your blood pressure increasing or your blood sugar increasing or your cholesterol increasing or your, uh, your, your ovaries increasing androgens, based on the environment, that is an appropriate response uh, because of the adversity that the body has to adapt to and try to survive. So, um, you know, that's one of our goals over here at HBAM is to uh, move us away from good, bad, high, low, you know, medicine, non, you know, like move away from all of that, appropriate versus inappropriate. All right, so as far as diagnosis goes, um, the diagnosis is going to start with a, a good medical history and physical, okay? The history is going to tell you a whole lot um, because once again, I told you, you know, <clears throat> periods. Once again, you have to have to be, you have to know uh, your periods, you know, when's the last one you had, uh, how long does it last, how long before you see your next one, is it regular, is it irregular, is it heavy, um, you know, clots, you know, all those things. We have to be paying attention to our body. So, this requires us to really slow the outside world down. Well, we can't slow it down, but slow down our response and our focus to the outside world and increase the focus to the inside world. Because at the end of the day, this is what really matters, because if this is not here, then nothing else exists. Right. So we have to learn how. And it's hard. It's easier said than done. I'm guilty of it myself. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to learn how to uh, decrease the outside stimulation and our response to the outside stimulation and focus more so inside, you know, what's really going on with your body and also increase our uh, response to it and, um, you know, take action and make sure we stay consistent with that action. All right. So uh, the physical exam. Um, so once again, the doctor or the practitioner, whoever is going to look for a lot of those uh, signs and symptoms that we spoke about, uh, they're going to look at your skin. Uh, they're going to look at, you know, for any discoloration, uh, they're going to be looking for any kind of uh, extra hair. And like I told you, you know, particularly we're looking under the uh, the jaw, the chin. Um, also, we're going to be looking for, um, you know, acne, uh, like I said, particularly on the chest and uh, on the back as well to the upper back. Well, I mostly see it on the upper back. I mean, but I'm sure it can be on the back just in general. <clears throat> uh, next, um, like I said, skin discoloration. Um, and then, you know, there's, they may do a pelvic exam. They may do a pelvic exam as well, too. Um, believe it or not, the pelvic exam can tell you a lot as well, too, because once again, testosterone, um, you know, tends to enlarge, makes things uh, bigger and enlarge things. And so, um, you know, there may be an enlargement of the clitoris as well, too. Um, there also may be an enlargement of the ovaries uh, or the ovaries may appear to be swollen as well. Um, then they may also recommend a, uh, a ultrasound a sonogram. And essentially, uh, with the ultrasound, <clears throat> they're looking at the ovaries. Um, now, so this is one of the characteristics. Uh, what this is one of the defining characteristics of polycystic ovarian syndrome, because on the ultrasound, you can see the ovaries. And so, what the uh, the, the radiologist is looking for when you're looking at the ovaries is uh, black 
black circles, black ovals. Uh, those black ovals are going to represent uh, fluid filled sacs. And so when you see multiple, when you see those in multiple numbers, then you know that's multiple, that's polycystic, that's polycystic. And that's not normal. Uh, those, uh, those follicles should have been released. Um, also, um, blood tests, right? So blood tests. Uh, so, I mean, they, they're going to check, they could, they could check for, uh, uh, male hormones, uh, the androgens, uh, the testosterone to see if that's increased. Um, you know, they may also check your thyroid and they may also check your cholesterol. The things that I recommend they check or I check myself, I make sure I always check. Most people will not, most, most practitioners will not be checking it. And I make a habit of checking this and that's insulin. That's insulin. I need to know what that insulin do. Like what, what does it look like? Um, cause the A1C may, A1C may be fine. The cholesterol may be fine. Uh, the CBC, everything else may be beautiful. And I, I have had three cases this week where the blood work looks like the perfect American dream, right? Where the blood work looks like uh, the, the house with the white picket fence and the, the, the two car garage, uh, the yellow daisies in the front yard, the family smiling, the birds chirping. However, you request that insulin and it looks like the basement with the chainsaw and the blood all over the wall and like the box. It looks crazy. So you can't you can't just go on blood work in general. You can't just go on blood work in general. This needs to be a holistic thing. This needs to be on a holistic thing. If you're just treating, if you have a practitioner that's just treating you based on your blood work, forget about it. That's metric management. And that unfortunately is what the healthcare system has become for the most part is uh, disease management, uh, metric management. So um, <clears throat> now, when you look in the medical text as far as um, the cause, no, I'm sorry, the cure for, for uh, PCOS, what is the cure for PCOS? And I mean, you can go to uh, womanshealth.gov. Uh, you go to you know any one of these official uh, websites as far as um, the cure goes. But what is the cure? What do they say is the cure? What's the cure? Yeah, let me see. What, let me see what y'all know. What's the cure for PCOS? Let me know. What do they say is the cure? Okay, somebody says weight loss. Okay, that's one of the things they recommend, but they don't they don't label that as being a cure. But that is one of the things they recommend you do. What is the cure? Somebody says prevention. How do you cure PCOS uh, based on these official websites? So I'll go ahead and kill the suspense. Um, they flat out tell you that there is no cure, right? They say there is no cure for PCOS, uh, but you can manage the symptoms for PCOS. Over here at HBAM, we don't agree with that. Just like we don't agree with the no cure for, for diabetes. Uh, diabetes is preventable and reversible. Uh, high blood pressure preventable and reversible, uh, high cholesterol preventable and reversible, PCOS preventable and reversible. And um, we'll get down to that. Y'all know how I do it over here. You know how I end it. Um, and so we'll talk about that. But um, what they'll recommend is medications or an extreme surgery where they actually cut piece of the ovary um, out. And with that cutting of the piece of the ovary out, not even the whole ovary, that's going to decrease the amount of androgens um, so that's going to decrease the, uh, the, the the symptoms that are being caused by the testosterone, but the PCOS is still there. All right, and it's it's very that's a very extreme uh, process to have to go through and go to uh, for something that largely is built off of insulin resistance. But let's take our time. All right, so um, they're going to make re recommendations for medications. Um, you know, birth control. They may make medication recommendations for birth control. But what if you don't? What if you want to get pregnant? What if you want to get pregnant? Um, they're also going to make medications. I mean, uh, make uh, recommendations for the uh, anti-androgen med medicines. So pretty much medications that decrease testosterone. But these medications are harsh and uh, very dangerous, especially if you're pregnant or you become pregnant. And so um, you know these medications are rarely recommended. But it's a possibility if you just want to deal with the actual symptoms. And then you have the, the darling of PCOS as far as the medication and treatment goes, metformin. Metformin. Oh, somebody got it. Amanda Mula, she got it. Metformin. 
What is metformin? What kind of medication is metformin? What is metformin used to treat? What is metformin used to cheat, treat? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. What is metformin used to treat? And how is metformin used to treat PCOS? Yep, AOK says diabetes. Exactly. So, yes, exactly. So, um, metformin is a anti-diabetic medication that's used for type 2 diabetes. Uh, BDs, uh, metformin improves, improves insulin's ability to lower blood sugar. Um, and um, in, the, in the case of PCOS, it's going to lower insulin as well as androgen levels. Now, why is lowering insulin important? Or we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Um, and also, what people would uh, the reason why PC, I mean, the reason why metformin seems to be the, the uh, darling of PCOS is because uh, women are going to women could possibly see weight loss, but also after taking metformin for like a month or two, their cycle comes back. They start ovulating again, and um, they, you know, I'll talk about what they say it is, but. This is one of the reasons, this is the main reason why metformin is the preferred treatment. Um, it's actually the darling of, uh, of a lot of people when it comes to uh, taking medications for PCOS. Now, the official stance as far as uh, PCOS is that when it comes to what is the root cause, because that's now we're about to switch over into HBAM role, right? We're about to switch over to HBAM style right now. So when you ask them what is the exact cause of PCOS, they will tell you it's not unknown. Uh, most experts believe that it's several factors, including genetics, that play a role. Listen, anytime you hear talk like that, when they start saying it's unknown, possibly genetics, and they have a large multi-million uh, dollar uh, industry built around it as far as the medications and the procedures go, you need to dig deeper. You need to dig deeper because there's a pretty good chance that the story you're being given as far as the pathophysiology of this quote unquote disease is not what they say it is, or they haven't told the complete truth or you don't know the complete truth or wasn't completely understood. So the big thing that we need to know about PCOS, now we're in full H band mode, y'all. All right, so the big thing we need to know about PCOS is that when it comes to PCOS, 70 to 95% of those who are considered to be overweight PCOS is insulin resistant. So they have two, when they, when they broke, break up PCOS, they break it up into two groups, right? They say uh, there's a lean PCOS and then there's an overweight obese PCOS. When it comes to the so-called overweight obese PCOS, 70 to 95% of those women have insulin resistance. When it comes to the lean, this is a huge range, but they say 30 to 75% of those people uh, have peace, uh, insulin resistance. All right, so insulin resistance. Go figure. So most people who have, most women who have uh, PCOS, it, they are also insulin resistant. Uh, there's this medical, there's this miracle medication called metformin um, that decreases the uh, response for insulin, which helps them get back on cycle, uh, decreases a lot of the symptoms. Dealing with uh, insulin, metformin is an anti-diabetic medication. What kind of, what are we seeing? Are y'all seeing what I'm seeing right now? Are y'all seeing what I'm seeing right now? Are y'all seeing what I'm seeing right now? No? All right. Let me make it a little bit clear. So I guess we need to ask the question of uh, what is insulin resistance? Man, what in the world is that? Uh, we need to ask the question, what is insulin resistance? And how does insulin resistance specifically affect females, women? Okay. So let's talk about that. When you eat really anything, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk as if we're talking about the standard American diet. All right, um, when you eat that food that you take in your body is gonna be broken down into what they call micronutrients. Uh, those micronutrients, we're talking about uh, fat being broken down to lipids, uh, carbs being broken down to glucose, 
uh, protein being broken down into amino acids. Insulin job is is a, is the main role. One of the main roles of insulin is to store nutrients, particularly when we're talking about carbohydrates, which breaks down into glucose. But don't get it twisted. Insulin is also secreted when we're talking about fat, just not as much. And also protein. Yes, protein will stimulate insulin because protein breaks down into amino acid. That amino acid has to go into the cells, has to go into the amino acid pool, and that's done by insulin. But particularly when we're talking about insulin being secreted, it's because of glucose. So that glucose, it needs to go into the cells because that's what the cells are using uh, primarily to run off of, right? So insulin, when you, when you bring in food, if you're bringing in food uh, that's coming from the standard American diet, the processed food, you're going to have a sharp increase in that glucose. That sharp increase in glucose is not natural. Uh, it's not what your body wants. But since that's what the body is facing, it now needs to make an appropriate response. I use the word appropriate. The appropriate response is going to be to compensate that glucose with insulin because insulin is responsible for making sure that those glucose molecules get into the cells, particularly uh, the liver cell and the muscle cells. All right. So that's that's how the normal physiology of the insulin and glucose works. However, when your body is constantly secreting insulin, anytime you have the persistence of any hormone, any hormone in a biological system, you are going to become resistant to that hormone because hormones are supposed to work in pulses. Pulses. They're supposed to work in a pulsatile uh, ma manner. Hormone secretion should not be a constant secretion. However, when you eat six meals a day, uh, every two to three hours throughout the day, you're facing the ground, the, the, the foundation of insulin resistance. Now, with insulin resistance, the, you're going to get told the story that the cells are no longer responding to uh, insulin the proper way. So now the glucose is not able to go into the cells because the cells are resistant to insulin. Right. And if you ask the question, why? Why are the cells resistant to insulin? You're going to get told that we don't really know. It could be because fat. It could be because of inflammation. Uh, it could be because it's all gummed up. You're going to get told multiple things about why uh, insulin is no longer able to go and activate the cells allow glucose in. Also, you're going to get told that the reason why you feel fatigued when you have insulin resistance is because you're suffering internal starvation. All right. And this, again, is not true. When we look at someone who has type one diabetes, let's switch over real quick. Type one diabetes. Uh, these are people who truly have internal starvation because type one diabetes, uh, their pancreas is no longer has the ability to secrete insulin. Once again, insulin's job is to escort glucose into the cells. Well, since they don't have that, glucose is going to build up in their bloodstream. And so type 1 diabetes was something that was traditionally diagnosed in kids. Uh, the way they would know that a child or they would have an idea that a child is type 1 diabetic is because uh, one, extremely hard time gaining weight. Uh, they would look emaciated. Uh, then two, uh, the mother might complain of the child's urine smelling sweet because all of the glucose uh, that they're just urinating out because the body's going to naturally send it to the kidneys and the kidneys are going to urinate it out. So their cells, the reason why they have a hard time gaining weight is because once again, the insulin is not there to put it in there. So their cells truly are starving because they don't have the ability to get the glucose into those cells. However, when we look at type two diabetes or someone who has insulin resistance, let's keep it a hundred. We can't we can't say that these people have internal starvation. They just don't because they don't look like what true internal starvation looks like, which is type one diabetes. What we're dealing with over here, and this is the part you need to write down, research, test me to it, hold my foot my feet to the fire. Um, but your cells are not starving. Your cells are actually stuffed. Your cells are at full capacity. When we're looking at someone who has type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, the reason why the cell has become resistant to insulin 
is because it already has enough glucose. Insulin is trying to put glucose into the cell. If you constantly are eating every two to three hours, six meals a day, and insulin is constantly there knocking on the door, trying to put glucose in, trying to put glucose in, uh, the individual is not walking, they're not active. At how much glucose do you think you can fit into a cell? How much glucose are you going to try to fit into that cell? And so since our bodies are intelligent and it understands what's going on moment by moment by moment, the body is now going to make an intelligent decision, an intelligent adaption, an appropriate response to downregulate the insulin receptors. And that is what insulin resistance is. It is your body making the intelligent adaptation to downregulate the insulin receptors because insulin glucose is no longer needed. Glucose is no longer needed. Until you deal with the glucose that we already have in this cell, we don't need it. Now, when we decrease the glucose by, you know, moving and doing other activities, then we will need more glucose. So that's what insulin resistance is, right? Everybody follow me so far with insulin resistance? Y'all follow me? All right, all right. All right, so let's keep this thing going. So that's insulin resistance. Now we need to know how insulin resistance affects the human in general, but specifically females. So men, what I want you to do with this is to flip it. Everything I'm about to say for the female, I want you to just flip it because you have something very similar to PCOS. It's called gynecomastia. Uh, it's also called uh, hypogonadism, all right? So this affects you just in the reverse way. When we're talking about PCO, when we're talking about insulin resistance in, the, in a female, insulin resistance affects every aspect of the body. That's why it is ridiculous to try to uh, nail down insulin resistance in one system. You don't, you don't exist in your body as a just one aspect. You're systemic, you're holistic. And if you don't, if we don't start to deal with our bodies as a holistic system, we're going to lose. We have to, once again, let go of Western philosophies, ideas that, you know, we, we, we exist in compartments and that's it. No. Trust me, if you're insulin resistant, it's not just your pancreas, it's not just your liver. All right. It's affecting the whole entire body. So when we're talking about how insulin resistance affects a female, the primary area, it affects multiple areas. Of course, it's going to affect the liver. It's going to affect the, kin kin the kidneys. It's going to affect the uh, pancreas. But the primary area is for the sake of the conversation with PCOS is going to affect the pituitary gland, which is a huge problem. All right. It's going to affect the pituitary gland. High levels of insulin is going to essentially make the pituitary gland, uh, I don't want to say insulin resistant, but for the sake of conversation, let's say insulin resistant, all right? But it's going to affect the pituitary gland. And when it affects the pituitary gland, we need to understand that that pituitary gland in the female is responsible for secreting two hormones. One called FSH, which means follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, the other one is called LH, stands for luteinizing hormone. Now, the pituitary gland secretes these three home, two hormones in a very balanced and delicate fashion, okay? And during the time of menstruation, during the time of ovulation, normally when you're, when the females are just having, a, just normal, walking around normal, it's not that time of the month, um, that there should be a two to one ratio. Two to one as in there should be more LH, luteinizing hormone, than there is FSH follicle stimulating hormone. However, when it's time for ovulation, those levels are now going to switch. There's a natural swap that goes on. You're going to have more follicle stimulating hormone and less LH. The reason for this is once again, because I told you, um, you're going to have that egg inside of the ovary. Follicle stimulating hormone its job is to stimulate that egg in hopes to getting it to full maturation, to full growth. Once that egg inside of the ovary reaches full growth, it will now release from the ovary 
and go into the uterus. From there, we get a little baby, right? <laughs> like the magic happens, we get a little baby, right? So, but if that does not happen, if that FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, does not properly stimulate that egg to the point where it fully develops, the body, once again, is intelligent. The body is going to adapt and it's going to keep the egg inside of the ovary. And this is something that can happen month after month after month. So why would there be, why would this happen? This happens when that swap, the swap that I told you about where uh, FSH now increases more than LH. Well, if you have high insulin levels, that's, and it's affecting the pituitary gland, that's not going to happen. You're not going to get that natural swap. So what's going to happen is when there's supposed to be ovulation or that time of the month and you're supposed to have that surge of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, it's not going to take place. Therefore, the eggs in the ovary or the egg in the ovary will not get stimulated to the point where it is now mature enough to release into the ovary where it can now be fertilized and we get a little baby. When that doesn't happen, the egg remains in there and then we will wait till next month to try again. And then it continues to happen over and over and over again. Okay. So <clears throat> that's how insulin affects the pituitary gland. How does insulin affect the ovaries? And this is why I start off the conversation by saying PCOS is type 2 diabetes of the ovaries. PCOS is diabetes of the ovaries. I would say it's type 4 diabetes. Because essentially the same way it, it affected the, the, uh, the pancreas, I'm sorry, the same way it affected the pituitary gland, uh, making it uh, insulin resistant, you're also going to have insulin resistance of the ovaries because now you're going to have high levels of insulin, high levels of insulin. The practitioner, nutritionist, the doctor, whoever is telling you to eat two to three uh, times a day, uh, eat six small meals. If you're trying to lose weight, you know, they're going to give you all this crazy advice. Uh, you're probably eating, uh, you know, the, if you're eating the standard American diet, more insulin, more insulin, more insulin, that insulin is going to get down to the ovaries and it's going to affect the ovaries. How does it affect the ovaries? I told you that your ovaries uh, is secreting multiple multiple horm hormones. Um, we're talking about estrogen, uh, progesterone, and yes, testosterone. However, when that when those ovaries are faced with high levels of insulin, the ovary is now going to secrete more androgen. It's going to now secrete more testosterone. When you have high levels of testosterone and you're not supposed to, you're a woman, you're a female, this is where we're going to see those other symptoms that we talked about. The facial hair, uh, the acne, uh, the hair thinning, the deepening of the voice, and so on and so on and so on. It's insulin, y'all. It's insulin. And like I told you before, when we look, insulin is the foundation of so many of these quote unquote diseases. Insulin is the foundation of so much of these so called diseases. I'm talking about blood pressure, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, PCOS, gynecomastia, hypogonadism. Obesity, PCOS, I'm sorry, insulin resistance is the foundation. It is the framework that all of these quote unquote diseases are built off of. Now, you may be thinking, well, if PCOS, I'm sorry, you may be thinking that if insulin resistance is the foundation and the framework for so many quote unquote diseases, why don't we just, just deal with the actual uh, insulin resistance? They tried that. They tried that back in the 60s. They had a name for it. The name got body and you don't hear about it anymore. You don't see it anymore. And what they did was they took insulin resistance and they chopped it up into little diseases. And they created little chemicals that would make cholesterol go down, blood pressure go down, blood sugar go down. Uh, you know, like we talked about with the uh, metformin, you know, the, all it made all these middle medications, all these chemicals that can deal with the symptoms of insulin resistance. But at the end of the day, 
what you're looking at is in some resistance. So what I'm saying is push all of that aside and understand that in some resistance is the foundation of all of these little different faces. These are just different faces of insulin resistance. So what is my recommendation? You know, I come over here, every time I come over here, I always leave my same recommendations. Um, I'll make it a little bit more condensed this time because what we need to talk, what we need to understand is that when we're talking about insulin resistance, we're looking at the quality of food and the frequency of food, right? So yes, of course, increase the quality of food. I'm talking about whole foods. Do your best to eat 80% or more plant-based whole foods, uh, especially leafy greens. The other aspect of it needs to be clean. It needs to be organic um, because you can't, you don't have room to play around in that area, but at least 80% plant-based whole foods. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with the whole foods part. Um, like I say, especially leafy greens. Um, two, increase the quality. Water. If you're drinking juice, once again, that is liquid diabetes, uh, that is diabetic fuel. So if you're drinking juice, if you're drinking soda, uh, Kool-Aid, um, milkshakes, all those things, cow milk, you know, all those things are doing is just fueling that process of insulin resistance. So switch over to predominantly drinking water. Um, so this doesn't have anything to do with the food, but it does have something to do with insulin resistance, and that is... Yo, what's the hormone I'm always talking about? What's the hormone I'm always talking about? And I told y'all that we, we are crazy low in. What's the hormone that I'm always talking about? Let's see. Let's see who be listening to him. Um, while y'all figuring that out, I'll get back to it. So people are going to tell you about the hormone that I'm always telling you all about. Um, but what, other than that, exercise. We have to move way more. High intensity interval training uh, specifically, but some movement is better than no movement. Boom, just Joe says she's absolutely right. Hormone D. Now, I know you probably heard of vitamin D, and what we're doing over here is we're working, we're shifting the narrative um, to stop calling vitamin D vitamin D, but now calling it hormone D because that is appropriate. Uh, hormone D is actually a, a hormone, vitamin D is actually a hormone um, that we get from the sun. Uh, this, this advice and recommendation that you're getting about, you know not going in the sun and using sunblock and sunscreen, I need y'all to just go ahead and ball that up real quick, all right? And then just place it in your nearest trash can and then set that on fire, all right? Um, you need the sunlight because the sunlight helps you produce hormone D. If you are low on hormone D, like 90s to 95% of the black community is, it makes you vulnerable for everything, specifically prostate cancer, uh, breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, kidney failure. Yes, kidney failure. Lo and behold, right, hormone D is actually a natural uh, anti-inflammatory uh, for the kidneys. Um, the kidneys actually activate hormone D. Um, and when they look at the studies, when you find anybody who's dealing with any one of these chronic conditions, there's a high chance that they are deficient in vitamin D, hormone D. I'm working on it. However, if you were to Pool people, a pool of people who were uh, in the a sufficient amount of hormone D, it's hard to find them being sick or having some kind of chronic condition. It's very hard. And that's because the vitamin D, the hormone D is very protective, particularly for us. Um, so we talked about, I told you, when we're talking about insulin resistance, there's two things we're looking at, uh, what we're eating and the frequency of when we're eating. So we talked about what to eat. Now let's talk about the frequency to eat. And of course, you know I'm gonna talk about it. Fasting is everything. Fasting is my gospel. Fasting is the one thing that I know for sure without a shadow of a doubt would radically improve the health conditions of our community overnight. Our problem is not that we, uh, we eat too little. Our problem is that we eat too much. On top of the fact that the food choices that we're making or the food uh, availability that we have in our community, such as the chicken spot, the Chinese spot, uh, the, the liquor store, uh, right next to the Dallas's. And once again, you know, it all baffles my mind when I think about just the audacity and the mindset of a company or individual or person or a group that would sit a Dallas clinic right next to a Chinese spot, the very place that caused you to be on the Dallas clinic, uh, the very place that has multiple uh, food items on that menu 
that has nephrotoxic ingredients. But I digress. So <clears throat> we need to understand that um, when we're talking about insulin resistance, uh, insulin resistance is the punching bag for fasting. Insulin resistance is fasting punching bag. There we go. All right. Why? Because I just showed you how we become insulin resistant. It's the persistence of insulin that makes you resistant. The more uh, the cost, the more you have insulin floating around in your bloodstream because of the foods that we're constantly eating two to three hours, six small meals a day, you have more insulin and more insulin. And so what happens, once again, the body's going to have to adapt. However, if you're not eating and you're just fasting, where's the insulin coming from? Where's the insulin coming from? If you don't eat anything, where's the insulin coming from? Yeah, you're going to have glucose. I, I know that. But where's the insulin coming from? You're going to have glucose because the glucose is stored in the liver as glycogen. And then during the periods of fasting, your body's going to break down that glycogen through a process called gluconeogenesis. Your body's not going to use that glucose as fuel, but you're going to get to the point where you no longer have any glucose. Once again, where is the insulin? There won't be any insulin. The insulin will slowly decrease. And that's what our body needs. It needs a break. From one, the craziness of the foods that we're taking in, but also two, from just eating in general. How would you like it if you were, if I worked you seven days a week, 24 hours a day, pretty much, because we eat around the clock um, and then we eat real late at night. And we got to understand that eating is a very metabolically demanding process. But how would you like if somebody was to, to, to make you work seven days a week? Um, overtime every single day without any break. How how energized are you going to be when you show up on the job the next day? How how are you going to function as far as the, uh, the as far as performance goes? Not very well. Our systems need a break. Fasting allows your system to not only detox, repair itself, heal itself. But it gives the body the break that it deserves and it needs. Okay, that 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 rest, that break is extremely crucial. Okay, so I highly recommend uh, fasting. You know, fasting is one of those things that um, you know, I have blogs. I have blog. Well, yeah. So utilize this channel because I've done several videos on fasting, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, so make sure you check out the video that I did on fasting. I did a video called uh, "Fasting Will Save the Black Community." Um, I also did a video called um, Our People Are Getting Horrible Health Advice. And so in those videos, I go through and I talk about fasting. Now, we also have a program where me and my team, we pretty much walk a group of people through 28 days of different fasting protocols. And um, we're finishing up our second group right now. And the results have been, the results are straight ter tear jerkers because it's very emotional. I mean, you have people in there we may I may even have some of the members on uh, Facebook right now watching us, but we have people in there who are lowering their blood pressure, um, having to go to their doctors to ask their doctors to take them off their blood pressure medication because the fasting plus the foods that they're eating are getting to the point where it's making them so healthy that they no longer need medications. Uh, we have people who are going from a 166 uh, fasting blood sugar in the morning down to an 88. You have people losing 20 plus pounds. Uh, within those 28 days um the mental clarity the mental clarity you got to understand that once again man we need it go check out my video i did a video on my facebook and it talked about um how i believe that our community many people in our community are walking around in a perpetual state of the itis um check out my video on uh on facebook or on instagram and i explain that process but nonetheless get into the lifestyle of fasting you can do that by watching one of the one of the many videos that i've done or you can come over and join us for our next challenge our next challenge starts on the um like i said it's three coaches uh i'm edward williams like i said i'm the physician assistant so i'm dealing with things from a medical aspect i'm also a personal trainer a nutritionist uh, then we have kathleen richardson from beauty and the barbell she's an african holistic uh, nutritionist uh, african holistic health coach um then we also have uh, tiffany davis who is the african diaspora chef so this challenge is very Afrocentric. We're doing this for the culture. Um, we're we're not doing any calorie counting. We're not doing any peeing on the sticks and checking our ketos. 
if, if that's what you do, then that's what you do. But we don't we don't do that in the challenge because we don't believe that that is life. We don't believe that uh, that's natural. Not do we not believe it, but we just it's facts. So um, that's what we do. And so I highly recommend that y'all go back through and watch those videos, um, you know, really figure out how you would benefit tremendously by fasting. All right. And that's why that's why fasting is something I push uh, very aggressive, uh, aggressively, because I know that it will radically improve our overall health. All right. So um, that's what PCOS is, polycystic ovarian syndrome. You know, essentially what we're looking at is a, uh, a disruption in the endocrine system of, the, of a female. Uh, when her body, her, her pretty much a pituitary gland is going to be affected by high insulin levels. Uh, her ovaries are going to be, be affected by high insulin levels as well, too. Uh, when the pituitary gland gets affected, it's going to uh, swap the ratio between FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. Um, and that will make sure that that surge does not take place during the time of ovulation. Like it should. Y'all yeah, appreciate this bar. Uh, but also when it affects the uh, the ovaries, when insulin gets to the ovaries, it's just stimulating it. It's going to increase the androgens, uh, particularly the testosterone. Um, and that's where we want to see a lot of the uh, manifestation of the other symptoms, such as the hair tourism, uh, the, the changing in the voice, the weight gain, um, and so many of these other symptoms that we saw. And this is all being caused by high levels of insulin. The reason why your insulin levels are so high is because you're resistant to insulin. The reason why you're resistant to insulin is because your body has made an intelligent decision to downregulate the receptors. Your body did this on purpose. It's not on accident. The reason why your body downregulate the receptors is because insulin is no longer needed to put glucose in the cells because the cells are actually at full capacity. The reason why the full are at, cells are at full capacity is because you just ate two hours ago and you did two hours ago before that and you did two hours before before that and because of the constant cycle of eating that the society has conditioned us to do and the food is not that good so that's pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome it is reversible you can't prevent it um and if you want to know more information like i said we have a challenge coming up uh, we're finishing up the second one right now and you can click the link right here in the description if you want to find out more about it and um, ask any questions that you have, and I will get right back to you, all right? So I appreciate you all for being up late with me at night, 1210. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, also, leave in the chat, you know, any topics that you would like for me to speak on. Um, my main area of expertise is going to be anything dealing with the, uh, with of course, insulin resistance. So you can pick anything off of that insulin resistant tree, um, metabolic, uh, metabolic conditions, um, and so I really want to, my, my, the goal was to really make sure that I address, uh, the main, the major, major issues in our community that's taking us out left and right. And so of course that dealt with heart disease, uh, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, cholesterol, all those things. So, um, you know, just let me know. All right. So I appreciate y'all very, very much. Appreciate y'all very much for staying with me. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, make sure you take some time right now, hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel and share this video out. I hope that it helps somebody. Um, when it comes to improving our overall conditions in our community, understand that we are on deck and we have to do the work. We have to do the work, all right? We cannot sit around and wait for anybody to come in and help us, uh, nor do we need that. Uh, we cannot wait for any kind of big funding or any kind of big project. We don't need that. Uh, the improvement, the radical improvement in our community is going to be straight grassroots, and that's what we need we need straight grassroots all right uh doing things such as just coming together like i don't care like group y'all group up in the chat group up in the chat educate each other about fasting and then just start doing it and then push it we have to do this for the culture fasting is nothing new fasting is african as hell is african 101 when we look back throughout our history and time we saw that fasting was always a basic principle of health once again when the acculturation process takes place we now take on the culture and the habits of those who are doing the oppressing, which is never going to work out for those who are oppressed. You dig? So this is why we got to throw, take all that stuff and place it in the trash can because quite simply, we can consider most of the health advice that we have, we can consider most of it as being automated oppression. 
automated oppression. All right. So anyways, it's our community. It's our responsibility. We have what it takes. Make sure we just start taking action. Uh, love on your people. Push the information. And we got this. All right. So I'm Edward Williams signing off. Help I even necessary. I'm going to holler at y'all later. All right. Peace.